So um, hello and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Pickers Security. Uh, my name is Simon Monaghan. I'm part of the Pickers product marketing team and also the host of today's session, um, which is on the subject of, of lateral movement and how to reduce lateral movement attacks. In recent times, uh, lateral movement has emerged um, as one of the tactics most widely used by adversaries to achieve their objectives. In today's um, session, we'll be um, bringing you up to speed on the latest lateral movement attacks, um, informing you about the latest techniques adversaries are using, um, and we'll also recommend some strategies um, to help you um, limit the risk um, of, of lateral movement inside your networks. Joining me um, to discuss this um, and more, um, I'm really delighted to introduce um, two of my esteemed colleagues at Picus. Um, firstly, Hussein uh, Chan uh, Johnny Yusel, um, and also uh, Eric Bang, uh, senior uh, solution architect within Pickers. Um, gentlemen, um, it's really great to see you as, as always. Um, maybe just to, to kick off, could I introduce, ask you just to um, briefly introduce yourself to, to today's audience? Um, Hussein, um, let's um, start with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Hussein Johnny uh, I have eight years of experience in the cybersecurity field, and I'm currently working at Pika Security as a security research engineer. I'm also an instructor at the Purple Academy, uh, where, we, where my colleagues and I deliver free and online cybersecurity courses to uh, everyone interested. Uh, today, I will talk about our research on lateral movement attacks uh, in this webinar. And you're saying this is this is obviously a co uh, subject quite close to your heart. You presented on this very subject during the uh, Black Hat Middle East recently, right? Yep. Uh, in November 2023, I attended the, the Black Hat Middle East as a speaker, and I talked on this very subject uh, about and informed uh, the attendees about how to uh, understand letter movement attacks and understand them. Thank you, and, and, and Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Hussein. Eric Bang here, one of our solu senior solution architects here at Picus. Uh, when it comes to my background, I've been in the cybersecurity space for about eight plus years now. I started out in more security analytical roles, being across a number of financial organizations in SOC teams, security analytical roles, red team, blue teams. Uh, and with that, moved over to Picus where uh, I found a tremendous need and value, which I ha wish I had at the time, to be able to automate a lot of the efforts I was doing during those roles. Being able to leverage PICUS in terms of simulations, um, mirroring what lateral movement might look like from an autom automated red teaming exercise perspective, understanding how adversaries can get an initial foothold in our environment, um, as well as how they might move and potentially compromise the network. Uh, is something huge and what really brought me here to Picus, which we're really excited to show you today on today's webinar. Uh, so happy to help in any way I can and pleasure to meet everybody. Thank you very much, Eric and, and Hussein. Um, so I think with the with the introductions over, I think we should, uh, we should dive straight into today's subject, um, lateral movement. Um, Hussein, um, lateral movement, it's not a new concept in security. I'm sure um, a lot of today's audience have a, have a good grasp of of lateral movement, um, but maybe there's a few that, that people that, that, that are less familiar with the concept. So as, as a starting point, um, maybe you could just briefly start out by explaining in, in your view what, what lateral movement is. Uh, as many of you know, modern enterprise networks are made of hundreds of hundreds of hosts and accounts, and they are typically mm -hmm. implemented in a network segmentation model uh, for different levels of users and information. Depending of the, on the objective, adversaries often need to compromise more than one system to achieve their finding, to achieve their goals. And compromising and controlling remote systems on a network is called lateral movement by the MITRE attack framework. Using lateral movement techniques, adversaries pivot to the mul multiple systems and accounts uh, in a compromised network. Uh, and in the uh, modern uh, cyber, uh, cyber attack campaigns, the lateral movement is an essential part of the attack campaign. 
Eric, when um, attackers perform lateral movement in site networks, what, what are they looking typically to achieve? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, from an attacker's perspective and an adversary perspective, objectives can really vary. Um, that could be some type of getting some type of financial gain, harming the reputation of an organization or even a country or countries. Uh, and that usually typically involves some type of gaining access to some type of sensitive data or uh, systems within an organization or infrastructure. Uh, with that, when gaining access to these critical assets uh, or crown jewels, you might call, uh, within an organization, they might leverage these compromises to do some data, data exfiltration, where they might take sensitive information out of your environment and you know, sell it on the dark web for some type of currency or financial gain, or even leveraging it for ransomware deployment, where they might encrypt files or sensitive directories to hold and en encrypt against the organization for some type of financial gain. Um, all the way from threatening to delete sensitive files or directories or information or data within an organization uh, that, so that they can leverage and use against organizations overall. In many and most cases, it is for some type of financial gain or harming a reputation of an organization. It's just the fact that they can do that, uh, which ends up being a detriment from impacting all sides of the party when it comes to the victims in the organizations that are being breached, um, not only from a public facing persona, uh, but also from their own um, overall costs and risk that is involved when it comes to the out output or the outcome of a say ransomware attack or uh, a successful lateral movement or compromise uh, by an attacker. And just how prevalent is lateral movement now, Hussein? I mentioned at the beginning that the, the, the tactic is, is on the rise. Just just how widely used is it now? Uh, annually, we publish a report called Threat Report, where we list and highlight the top 10 MITRE tactics techniques used by mal malware samples. Uh, in the 2023 edition of the uh, Threat Report, uh, we analyzed more than 500,000 uh, malware samples and observed that uh, adversaries are increasingly leveraging the uh, lateral movement techniques in their malwares. Adversaries commonly exploited remote services, used remote system discovery techniques and VMI to discover remote systems, execute commands on these remote systems and obtain cre uh, account credentials to move laterally within the network. Uh, although these techniques were listed in our report for the first time, they accounted for more than 30% of the observed attack techniques in 2023. This shows how lateral movement became a significant tool for adversaries and also threat for organizations. Eric, you've been working in, in security for, for, for a long time now and, and talk to, to customers on a, on, on a daily basis. Um, just how aware do you think they are of, of some of the risks of lateral movement? And, and Hussein there was talking about its prevalence. It can be seen in sort of 30% of, of malware samples. So yeah, how, how, how aware do you think um, organizations are of, of, of the risks of, of, of lateral movement? Yeah, I think with today, in, in today's day and age, a lot of organizations don't have uh, an assumed breach mindset. Uh, which is really important in terms of being proactive, in terms of understanding how a threat actor might respond or react or move laterally and compromise a potential network when it comes to the organization that they're uh, uh, targeting. Uh, I think with that, I think it's very important to be able to plan for the worst and being able to be proactive before an actual day of a breach, uh, which is equally important from an external point of view, but also an internal point of view altogether. Um, with that, uh, you know, there's been stats where 54% uh, of uh, techniques and tactics that are executed during testing of lateral movements are missed. Uh, and many a times, uh, there's been another study where 96% of lateral movement behaviors does not even trigger um, an alert in a sim, causing SOC teams to be completely blind. Uh, within their own environment when it comes to these adversary type behaviors. Uh, and it's really about not being reactive, but really being proactive at the end of the day, being able to see and sit and be in the 
shoes of a threat actor, looking at it from their lens and running these exercises in your own environment to really know what it would be like and know exactly how your team, or your SOC or your blue team will actually respond when it comes to uh, a, a worst case scenario, you know, breach day or that game day uh, where we're, what, what, are we, what are we going to do when it comes to running playbooks or incident response exercises when it comes to these types of behaviors within our own environment? And I think that's critical uh, to today's day and age where we're just not practicing enough uh, in security when it comes to techniques such as lateral movement within your assumed to breach mindset into your internal network. Do you think there's maybe an also an, an also a, an argument here to say that the increase in lateral movement is is a result of attackers having to work harder as well? So yes, maybe awareness of lateral movement can improve, but the increased prevalence could suggest as well that um, security teams are having to make attackers work that bit harder in an environment once once they've been able to achieve an initial compromise. Actually, uh, our research shows that. Uh, adversaries spend a lot of time in lateral movement te techniques because after you breach the defenses, the perimeter defenses, you gain an access to a single co compromised machine and you have to go through uh, all the network co co uh, controls to move within the lateral movement, uh, within the network and uh, exploit lateral movement techniques. Uh, because uh, many sensitive data are not in the edge nodes. Uh, they are stashed in the network itself, and many organizations are de deploying the defense in depth techniques. So you will not be able to find um, sensitive data on in in the uh, perimeter of the network, but in deep inside the network. That's why adversaries need to leverage lateral movement techniques more and more, and spend a lot of time uh, to stay stealthy and. Uh, a compromise as many machines as possible. Could you help us, um, Hussein, to understand a little bit more how about how attackers are uh, leveraging lateral movement as part of the life cycle of attacks? As many of you know, that mitre attack techniques, uh, mitre attack framework uh, lists techniques by their tactics, and the first tactic of many uh, cyber attacks is the reconnaissance stage. Uh, in the reconnaissance stage, adversaries aim to collect as many information as possible about their target environment, target network. Uh, this information can be about employees, infrastructure, services, and the network topology. Uh, for example, in the first attack path, uh, adversaries might use uh, job listings in, in your website to see, check that which type of technologies you are using or uh, they may check uh, dark web for compromised credentials in an, uh, in other uh, credential dumps. So after collecting enough information, attackers make an attack plan using the identified attack vectors and potential attack paths. In the next stage, uh, using the collected information, uh, uh, adversaries try to gain initial access to your net network. Uh, by exploiting the attack paths, adversaries create an entry point to the net target network and gain initial access. This step is vital for attack campaigns because it allows adversaries to execute commands in the victim's environment. However, compromising a single host is uh, on an enterprise level network is often not enough to cause significant impact. They need to move uh, to other systems to gain uh, significant uh, access. Uh, that's why in the next stage, adversaries try to compromise other hosts in the network to achieve their goals. This stage is called lateral movement. In lateral movement stage, attackers aim to compromise as many hosts and users as possible without raising alerts. Compromising more machines in the target network potentially allows adversaries to cause more significant damage. However, as the rate of infection increases, the risk of being detected also increases. Therefore, adversaries need to be silent in their operations also. <clears throat> after the target network, yeah. yeah. After the target network is partially or fully compromised, uh, adversaries arrive at the 
final stage, the impact stage. Depending on the address's motivation, the impact stage may have different outcomes. For a ransomware attack, the impact stage would be file encryption. For a Viper malware attack, it would be a damaging MBR or file deletion. This is the final stage of the life cycle. And as you can see, the impact depends on the number of and number of compromised hosts and the value of compromised data. Therefore, uh, a successful letter movement stage determines the impact of the overall attack. Um, and, and, and Eric, um, what are some of the vulnerabilities or misconfigurations within internal networks that enabling attackers to, to perform lateral movement as part of this life cycle? Yeah, no, that, that's a very quick, quick question. And the beginning of any kind of uh, potential compromise is to what Hussein mentioned earlier. It's that first initial foothold on a targeted system. And that first step in that patient zero is usually some type of a public facing server or with a vulnerable service or um, a client computer or even a weak point on in a on a security on someone's security infrastructure that initial access point is so important and so critical uh, when it comes to your external facing assets in the perimeter um, and typically that's some type of vulnerability something that's truly exploitable uh, when it comes to potential you know public facing application understanding where your common weaknesses exposures are to even your CVEs that live within your public facing servers. Uh, I think those are really important to address at first, as Hussein mentioned, but then the second component is what kind of vulnerabilities or CVEs could be exploited uh, when it comes to misconfigurations into your internal network? What could happen post uh, that initial access or that initial foothold uh, within your internal network from the outside in? Once you're inside the network, what else can they do to compromise other systems? And some of those misconfigurations can be you know, excessive uh, user privileges, where someone's able to abuse a, a user rights or privileges or permissions uh, to do more harm in the network. Uh, that could even fall under in inadequate or um, poor network part uh, partitioning or segmentation being able to move from one domain to another or a trust domain uh, that's unnecessarily configured, um, all the way from abusing or exploiting uh, vulnerabilities uh, within your internal network, misabusing protocols like WMI or SMB or RDP, where you can remotely hijack sessions uh, from one system to another to even leveraging valid accounts to gain unauthorized network access to different uh, assets or hosts within the infrastructure uh, to essentially gain key potential keys of the kingdoms where they can get a potential admin account across the network or a domain admin account that could then now allow them to do anything with the inf infrastructure. Um, all of which are really important to address when it comes to abusing and exploiting many misconfigurations that can fall not only within vulnerabilities, but even policies that can be abused and, and, and um, exploited from an adversary perspective. You're saying we know that the breaches are, are an operational reality really is is the key here being able to um, restrict an attacker once they've been able to achieve initial access um, to really prevent uh, a, a breach becoming a, a real serious business impacting incident uh, in large networks breaches might happen and the large organizations are have hundreds maybe thousands of uh, users or hosts in their network. Uh, however, uh, breach doesn't mean the impact would be significantly more without uh, later moments. Impact of a cyber attack can be measured by the number of compromised systems and the uh, criticality of the compromised data. If adversaries were to be stopped before fully compromising the network, the impact would be diminished significantly. Therefore, Limiting the uh, adversary's movement in the network has a great chance to prevent a breach to become a major incident. In um, Hussein, in your example, you showed uh, two two um, types of uh, attack paths. Um, a question question for Eric. So, um, how many, or maybe either of you actually, typically, how many 
of these paths exist within within an organization. Given the complexity of, of IT environments, um, I'm expecting that there's probably quite a lot. Yeah, for simplicity's sake, I gave two uh, example attack paths, but uh, in a large network, uh, there are potentially uh, hundreds of uh, attack paths that can be exploited by adversaries. Although uh, not a, all hundreds of them are have uh, have significant impact or potential to be exploited fully, uh, defenders need to identify these attack paths uh, before adversaries do and prioritize them by their potential impact that would be uh, after they are compromised. So it's not necessarily just about always identifying every theoretical path. It's it's also an element of validation to ensure that those paths actually could be exploited by an attacker in, in practice. Yeah, without uh, actual exploitation uh, or actual potential to be exploited, uh, all theoretical paths do not have the same impact uh, to the target network. They may, they may exist theoretically, but in actuality, adversaries might not be, be aware of that or might not be able to exploit it uh, when they got the chance. Um, so, so, Eric, that begs the question, you know, what can organizations do to, to identify paths and also um, validate which ones actually pose a risk? Yeah, great question. I think at the end of the day, detecting lateral movement attacks is hard and it's diff difficult. Uh, that's, that's because it's really hard to differentiate between what's legitimate versus malicious network traffic when it comes to our user actions or a potential attacker or anomalous behavior. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, 54% of techniques and tactics when it comes to executing lateral movements are missed. You know, 96% of those lateral movement behaviors don't even trigger an alert within a SIM technology or a log aggregation technology. Uh, I think with that, it's really important to practice, right? I think if you have kids or you play sports, you know, we, you, we don't expect them to be, you don't expect to be the best where your kids to be the best on actual game day if you just throw them in there without any kind of practice. So why aren't we doing that in security? We should be practicing more frequently uh, when it comes to simulating potential lateral movements in our environment, um, conducting maybe more frequent pen testing in our environments, threat hunting exercises to even red team tabletop exercises uh, to know how well our teams will respond when it comes to our SOC, our blue team, and being able to do the proper triaging, incident response, or exercising any kind of playbooks that we would expect to come out of those outcomes and those types of behaviors. Uh, so being able to be able to identify what it would be like to be in the shoes of those three actors, what would they would really do or hypothetically do in our environment and understanding where those paths are is that first step. And then obviously creating the right playbooks beyond that on how we want to react as a team and an organization to protect our assets post-compromised in that assumed breach mindset. You mentioned, some, uh, you mentioned some examples of approaches there like pen testing for helping to identify mm -hmm. Um, Hussein, there are also some dedicated tools to help with this, aren't there? Some of our audience might be familiar with attack path management tools like, like Bloodhound, for instance. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about them and, and what their approach to attack path management is? The attack path management tools uh, have two different categories. Uh, the first one is Bloodhound-like uh, tools. Bloodhound and Infection Monkey comes to mind. Uh, they are much more like uh, spray and pray type of tools. They uh, try every uh, available techniques under their tool set and generate lots of noise in the network, uh, creating uh, a lot of detection alerts. However, adversaries do not use these techniques because uh, when adversaries are detected, they, are, they have a high chance to be stopped and they ha have a high chance to be uh, prevented to cause a significant damage. That's why adversaries try to stay as silent as possible uh, and they do not want to trigger defensive alerts. That's why Bloodhound uh, and Infection Monkey are great tools 
However, they generate a lot of noise and create a lot of detection alerts. That's not how adversaries conduct the thermometer attacks. Um, so, Eric, I guess this does beg the question about what can security teams do to to manage attack paths more more effectively? Yeah, no, and that's back to my earlier point. Uh, one really great practice you can do, and which really brought me here to Picus, um, is where we offer a four-step process uh, around managing and identifying attack paths in your environment. Uh, and that four steps include discovery, validation, prioritization, and optimization. The goal really is to identify, one, all possible attack paths within your organization, and especially in determining what's that least path of resistance Hussein mentioned to prioritize mitigation of critical attack paths to target the crown jewels as quickly as possible, but also as subtly as possible without being identified in the network or discovered in the network by a, def a defensive team. Um, in that initial discovery phase is really understanding what is your attack surface, understanding externally where you stand from a perimeter standpoint, where your public facing applications, servers, assets, you name it, all the way to your internal network. Uh, and, and beyond that, to even your cloud environment, where do we stand from a risk exposure perspective when it comes to the assets that we hold within the organization? And then the second step is validating our security posture, having that hacker-like threat mentality around uncovering your critical security gaps. What could potentially occur uh, when running lateral movement type techniques in your environment as if an actual adversary might do? Uh, and then as you validate, prioritizing those most critical attack paths to maximize your efficacy of your security infrastructure. What would an attacker do to quickly achieve their attacker objective, like obtaining domain admin privileges or keys of the kingdom uh, to first prioritize amongst our defensive team to implement any kind of hardening techniques or prevention protocols or controls uh, to detection capabilities, and ultimately optimizing our security program uh, in a continuous manner uh, to improve our resilience and reduce our overall business risk when it comes to our most critical assets, uh, but in an automated and continuous motion where, it, you know, where we might address mitigation today, are we still preventing and detecting as we would expect from our defensive teams uh, on an ongoing basis, on a quarterly or weekly basis, opposed to, you know, your more traditional once a year pen test that typically tar you know, take a level of overhead and cost and services beyond that, um, which is why we're really excited to show you what Picus has to offer in terms of uh, addressing lateral movement in the assumed reach mindset. I think what Eric was, was describing there really is, is a need to be able to take action and derive actionable insights, right? You say, you know, having visibility of hundreds, thousands of attack paths in, in, your, in your environment, okay, it, it, it can increase visibility, but back to that earlier point, it can be difficult to prioritize them. So Eric was talking about high risk paths. So are these high risk paths, you know, typically like the shortest paths, you know, within an environment. So how is an attacker going to achieve the objective in the in the quickest, most efficient way possible? Is it, is it really those paths that we're talking about? Actually, uh, although we have the information about hundreds of attack paths, uh, we need to focus on and prioritize the high risk ones first, because they have the much more potential to be impactful in case they are exploited. Uh, and often uh, we have choke points in our network and we have significant high, high risk uh, attack paths in our network that when we uh, patch those and we significantly reduce the risk of lateral movement attacks. That's why instead of focusing on all the uh, attack paths identified, we should be focusing on high risk ones because uh, they are much more uh, efficient way to approach this uh, attack path management uh, techniques. Um, 
we've spoken about the need for validation and, and we'll get into a, a bit more of that later in the session and, and Eric's going to give us a, a demo of, uh, of Picus attack path validation just to uh, explain our approach to attack path management. Um, but at this point, Hussein, I think it would also be good to maybe talk the audience through some general strategies that they can use to limit um, lateral movement inside networks. Uh, and you have a list of, uh, of recommendations for us. Sure. Uh, the lateral movement is from uh, uh, accessing, uh, pivoting from the initial compromise machine to other uh, hosts and systems. That's why we need to provide a, a stronger authentication to access remote systems in, in our network. Without strong, uh, strong authentication, uh, adversaries might use dumped credentials to move laterally from one machine to other, uh, another machine or pivot to other network segments. Uh, that's why we need to implement a stronger authentication, preferably turning on uh, 2FA or MFA uh, when we are accessing remote systems or remote resources. And the second one is the implementing the least privileged uh, approach. Uh, not all users need to have all the access to the network assets. They need to implement as uh, they, they implement the least privileged access model to be able to do their job, but they, they should not be able to overreach their privileges. And also, uh, similar to the attack life, attack life cycle, when uh, adversaries trying to conduct lateral movement attacks, they are also doing reconnaissance within the network uh, and trying to uh, compromise any vulnerable system or vulnerable uh, software application within the network. That's why we need to implement patch management for our perimeter network and also inside the uh, network and in, uh, internal assets also. That's uh, that in this way we are reducing the attack surface that can be exploited in the network uh, and limiting the options that adversaries can uh, exploit for lateral movements. And also, uh, as our networks are growing uh, day by day, uh, the security validation should be continuous. Uh, and consistent throughout our network because as we are growing, uh, as our network grows, uh, the security validation needs are all, always on, uh, uh, always will be needed uh, as we are growing and the continuous efforts needs to be paid for the uh, security validation efforts also. You're saying thank you. Um, Eric, let's uh, let's um, pick up on, on, on the last point again around uh, security validation, um, and, 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 and in the list here it says consistent security validation. How how important is consistency? So how how regularly should organisations be looking to to identify and validate attack paths in their environments? Yeah, huge. I mean, at the end of the day. How many times do you hear about zero days and new vulnerabilities and CVEs that come up to surface? Uh, I think with that, you know, we aren't practicing enough. I think in a traditional mindset where before we leaned on, you know, perhaps a once a year pen test. Uh, and, and with those type of engagements, uh, they happen only once a year. What do you do after you get those results or that report and you start implementing mitigation? How do you know for certain the next time you have a pen test or you have those vulnerabilities that might have been identified or remediated properly. You're now, set, you're now subjected to a static time period within that pen test where now you have to wait a you know, six to 12 month period before validating the ability of remediation and mitigation. So being able to do this as frequently as possible is, is critical where we can start to practice on a much more ongoing basis, whereas we understand new zero days come out on a weekly basis. How are we making sure that we're addressing old, perhaps, security gaps within our environment, uh, but also new security gaps that might emerge uh, to the surface in today's threat landscape? Uh, I think with that, the more the merrier is really the mentality there, um, as threat actors don't rest or sleep. 
You know, they're, they're always finding new and, and creative ways to traverse and bypass and uh, be as subtle as possible when it comes to um, the, you know, prevention controls, such as EDR technologies that might sit within your security stack. Uh, I think being able to continuously run that motion of practicing on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis as frequent as possible, it only best improves your security posture over time in that automated and continuous motion. Um, so I don't think there's any too much when it comes to practicing. I think the more practicing, the better you'll be uh, when it comes to your overall resilience uh, and preventing capabilities or detection capabilities to an adversary or potential breach to the organization. So how can um, an attack simulation tool um, like the Pickers platform and, and our attack path validation product um, help organizations in, in this regard? Yeah, so being able to automate a lot of those efforts, as I mentioned, red teaming exercises, tabletop exercises, um, even pen testing capabilities um, into a fully cloud SaaS solution that Pickers provides in the form of attack path validation being a solution that we offer here, uh, allows it to automate a lot of those red teaming efforts. Uh, being able to run these attack techniques of lateral movement, trying to do continuous credential dumping type techniques to even privilege escalation uh, to move from one asset or one host internally when it comes to obtaining uh, a potential crown jewel or domain admin privileges is, is critical. Um, so being able to minimize the level of effort and cycles by our team, if today we don't have a red team or we do have a red team, um, allows to free up much more time when it comes to our resources to prioritize how we can go about improving our overall security posture and resilience overall. And, and Hussein, the ability to automate means that you can achieve wider visibility, right? Uh, in a typical red team, uh, an assessment might involve maybe one initial access point, but with a with an automated tool, you could test from the perspective of, of different access points within an environment and, and achieve that better understanding of, of how an attacker's movements might change dependent upon their, their starting point. In panther scenarios or red teaming scenarios, uh, often the casters uh, or the red teamers uh, have a goal to, uh, say, for example, accessing a particular uh, file or compromising a particular uh, account. That's why they try to they focus on a single uh, goal and or multiple goals uh, with a limited scope, and, and they do not try all the attack paths or all the uh, available solutions or for better moments uh, that's uh, that's why we need to automate as many possible uh, as many uh, techniques as possible to uh, identify the attack paths and test all the possible solutions uh, because red teaming are uh, red teamers and pen testers are uh, limited scope and uh, human as humans often uh, miss uh, the attack paths uh, compared to automated solutions because automated solutions cover much more comprehensive scope than humans. It's an interesting point there. Um, automated tools like the Pickers platform, are they there to completely replace the need for, for manual assessments and, and manual red teamers? Hussein or Eric, sorry. Maybe you could take this one, Eric. Can we put the question? Uh, yeah, you were talking about um, uh, about manual versus automated assessments, and I just wondered um, what your view is on on automated tools completely replacing manual manual assessments. Uh, actually, uh, we can automate many manual tasks using uh, automated tools. However human ingenuity is still in play. Uh, we still need to do our regular pen testing, regular red team exercises. Uh, automated tools uh, takes the uh, manual wor workload from our uh, security professionals and they it eases their approach and helps them uh, build better uh, attack scenarios without spending a lot of time or resources. That's why 
uh, two uh, things are not exclusively eliminating each other. They are they can go hand in hand and improve the organization's security posture uh, uh, in an elevated stage. So on the contrary, automated tools are there to augment um, rather than, than, than replace. It's to help red teamers focus on maybe more sophisticated techniques or, or areas of the network that, that, um, that could involve more, more manual, um, manual assessment. Sure, uh, because in automate, uh, automated solutions often do not try to harm the system. They try to, uh, for example, uh, automated solutions should not be simulating DDoS attacks but a red teamer can uh, launch a DDoS attack in a controlled environment. However, if we were to do it, it in an automated system, it might uh, disrupt the business uh, operations uh, and daily operations in a network. Um, so Eric, I think this is um, probably a good point and um, maybe to give our audience a, a quick overview of, uh, of Picus attack path validation, just to show uh, how it works in a little bit more detail. Um, following the demonstration, and we will um, ask our audience to uh, submit their questions. Um, so if you do have anything that you want to put to Eric or Hussein, um, do start uh, having a think about that and, and putting your, uh, your, uh, your questions into the, uh, into the Q&A. Great. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Hussein. i um, love to show you what we have today when it comes to our attack path validation automated red teaming assumed breach solution. Uh, with that comes that automation component. Now, how do we save our team's time if we do have a red team or we don't have a red team uh, and save them a lot of cycles when it comes to those manual low hanging fruit, uh, when it comes to those efforts they put in uh, that could be um, monumental in saving them their own time when it comes to the capabilities of automating a lot of their effort. Uh, this is a completely agentless solution uh, where you're able to deploy on any type of initial access point or compromised system with your environment and be able to run a number of attack techniques uh, within the environment to potential discovery around lateral movement and eventual potential attack path maps that could be discovered. Uh, within the dashboard, we'll have a breakdown of the total simulations we were able to automate and run within an infrastructure, any attack paths we were able to discover, um, as well as any objectives or attacker objectives we were able to achieve or unachieve. Earlier, I mentioned initial access points. Consider these are compromised assets at zero point. You know, where within our infrastructure are we looking to assess if a user or a workstation endpoint or server were to be compromised, what type of blast radius could occur or impact could occur when it comes to the overall network that it's within? You know, is that within the same domain? Is that targeting another domain um, when it comes to being compromised from a single asset? Uh, and, and the overall detriment impact when it comes to the overall network and potential attack paths that could accrue based on an attacker perspective. Uh, and with that comes a number of techniques those techniques can fall under harvesting attack vectors, uh, where we have enumeration techniques that a threat actor would typically utilize and leverage uh, when it comes to you know, dumping tokens or credentials or hashes or Kerberos tickets or even to clear text passwords that could be leveraged uh, to potentially enumerate, but also leverage to move within the organization or network. That next component is exactly that. You know, how do we move laterally uh, once we enumerate some type of credentials that could be leveraged for an attacker that has either higher level of permissions, um, LVing would elevate their own privileges, or even leveraging a valid account that was discovered. And that is a form of some type of you know, discovery. You know, are we able to identify any ports or misconfigurations to move laterally and move outside or inside the network from that initial access point. You know, is that an SMB protocol or a WMI protocol to uh, an RDP protocol to even passing the ticket, which will then also identify here in the dashboard in terms of what techniques we were successfully able to exercise within that assumed breach simulation. Within these techniques, we'll then identify findings. You know, did we enumerate any type of users, tokens, hashes, passwords, or successful sessions uh, within the simulation itself, as well as any 
devices identified uh, when it comes to being leveraged during the attack path simulation or just observing uh, that they exist with the network, understanding the ecosystem or network that we're looking to compromise uh, within the network as if a true attacker would. And being able to run these simulations is very easy and seamless for any end user, uh, where if you don't come from a red teaming background or an offensive background, you now have the capability of having a threat-centric mindset where you're able to validate your efforts from a defensive perspective where you don't need necessarily know how to do any kind of LSAS credential dumping and leveraging, you know, Mimikatz or Proc Dump or Rubius. We now are able to leverage a solution like attack path validation where you can now exercise those type of techniques. You can easily do so by running a simulation. So here we have our Create Simulation tab. Within the Create Simulation tab, there's always a number one attacker objective when it comes to any adversary or threat actor in today's threat landscape. And that is getting keys to the kingdom across your network. And that typically is in the form of obtaining domain admin privileges. Once you have domain admin privileges, you can do essentially anything in the network as if an IT administrator could do. Uh, and within the simulations, we'll mirror what a attacker would do in their attacker steps, in which we identify here within a four-step process, uh, where first is some type of discovery, which is some type of enumeration where we're able to scan systems, uh, scan the system of compromise, the internal network it's li that it lives within, and fingerprinting assets. So here we're discovering a number of domain objects, you know, network shares, user accounts, services, uh, group policies, you name it. The next step of any adversary is then to try to get some type of elevation in their privileges. You know, we're going to try a number of privilege escalation techniques. Can we escalate our own privileges? Can we compromise credentials? Uh, can we do some type of credential access as a attack tactic where we leverage the harvesting groups to enumerate tokens or credentials or hashes or Kerberos tickets or even plain text, clear text passwords as mentions. And as we start to obtain those permissions, either through valid accounts or your own privilege escalation, is then to move laterally and then attempt the same four-step process to eventually gain the overall attacker objectives where we'll eventually identify some type of misconfiguration or um, domain admin privileges that might fall within another asset, but which then is the ultimate goal of these simulations in any threat actor. Being able to configure these is very straightforward. I don't necessarily need to know how to do you know, local user enumerations or password policy enumerations, even LSAS credential dumpings. Within the attack path validation solution, you can easily enable or uh, disable these through a toggle, where I want to run every single technique uh, that I like to test in my environment uh, and see if it's capable from an attacker's perspective. Here, you'll define a, a number of enumeration techniques in our harvesting groups, uh, where you know, we'll define for our decision engine uh, basic enumerations like local users, password policies, domain groups, you name it, um, all the way from credential dumping, authorization, and authentica authentication related tasks. Um, so I mentioned LSAS, credential dumping, the Amima Cats, Rubius, Sharp Cats, Proc Dump, you name it, all the way to Kerber Roasting, where we're cracking passwords of a potential service account or obtaining you know, a password hash from Active Directory, all of which you can enable here within the configuration but not necessarily need to know and develop those codes or payloads uh, where you're able to easily just toggle them uh, within the dashboard. The second step I mentioned is access groups. You know, how do we want to move laterally once we obtain potential credentials um, where we want to exploit and authenticate or remote into various ports? You know, is that via WMI, SMB, and ZEC? Is that passing the ticket, all of which I can enable and disable um, either you know, through... Um, the configuration here, uh, and then there we'll do that on your behalf. So if that's PowerShell remoting for passing the ticket to passing the hash via Rubius, um, all of which you can identify here uh, within the simulation configuration. Once we've chosen our harvesting groups and attack group or access groups, uh, we'll then define a scope, which is extremely critical when it comes to simulations, right? At the end of the day, we want to kill switch. We don't want us to be sitting in your environment too long for too long, uh, which then ends up uh, spending too many resources or um, 
creating too much noise in your environment. Uh, so being able to create a kill switch or a time timeout configuration is important in terms of how uh, how do you want to monitor this activity when you're running these simulations in comparison to maybe a sim or sock that should technically identify these type of behaviors in your environment as we are running a simulation in your environment. Uh, the second is creating some type of potential limitations. You know, is that a specific domain you're trying to access um, outside the initial access point or compromise system? Or is that just sitting within the same domain? Here you can define that within this field, as well as exclude any kind of host names or critical assets where you don't want tickets to touch uh, when it comes to potentially impacting or disrupting potential business assets within your environment. Uh, and then also, finally, you have the option of password cracking. Here, our team has done the legwork for you in interpreting and scraping the dark web of uh, leaked passwords or commonly used passwords, uh, where in a, a way, in a form, we're going to attempt these in terms of identifying account credentials and users, uh, and then trying these passwords to see if we can authenticate into different assets uh, and potentially compromise additional assets within the network. Finally is that uh, binary payload. You know, so some of our deployment options, so what we call a stager. So our deployment options are for our PICUS implants. You know, this, these implants are going to be your assumed breach assets. You know, where are we looking to trigger and deploy these when it comes to a potential compromised asset? Within all of our deployments, all of our uh, stagers or implants uh, run off memory. So there's, again, no agent that is required to be installed. Uh, some of these options include different execution methods uh, where we might have TLL sideloading injections uh, or techniques uh, to implants uh, to asynchronous procedure call injections. Uh, with, with that comes pre-built evasion techniques for certain EDR technologies, again, to be as secretive or subtle as possible in the infrastructure as if a true adversary would be. Once we run our simulation, we'll then get some type of output. So what was successful within the simulation in potentially obtaining domain admin privileges? With that comes an output of an attack path. We'll map out exactly from the initial access point what we did. Here we'll see the overview of what our objective is, who our initial access point or stager was deployed upon, what domain we're living in, how long did it take to achieve that domain admin objective, um, as well as the harvesting techniques we configured. Um, as well as the access vectors that we configured all together. Within the, within the activity feed, we can watch the activity and simulation in real time. So as we run the simulations, we can review the output or results at the end of the simulation. Uh, but with that, we'll tell you exactly what we did in discovery or enumeration. Uh, within any type of attacker step is first implementing some type of bypass or persistent capabilities. So as it, if any adversary would do, we would clone some type of process as a fail safe. So as an adversary would do, we would do as well. So here we have a clone process that we are kicking off in the case of any EDR that might kill the original process, allowing simulations to continue um, after as a fail safe if it were to be quarantined or killed as a process from the original state. The second step is always some type of enumerations. An adversary or a red team will always start a number of enumeration techniques uh, to then uh, understand the environment they're facing. So that might first look like some type of domain object enumeration. Being able to understand the number of containers or group policies uh, to groups, to OUs, uh, to servers, to users or workstations that are found within the network. Some others can be domain group enumerations. You know, are there any kind of objects that can be successfully enumerated from groups to users uh, to even DNS uh, type um, enumeration where we want to understand the active directory or math domains within an infrastructure. Here we'll try a number of enumeration techniques if successful or unsuccessful. Any factor just wants to understand their environment that they're targeting. And we'll do the exact same for you through the simulations. Once we've identified all of these enumerations from you know, group policy, uh, maybe an old technique, or finding kerber objects uh, to retrieving potential privileged credentials, 
um, we will then leverage the enumeration to our decision engine. With that, our decision engine is an intelligent decision developed by Picus, uh, where we then understand, after understanding the enumeration techniques in the environment that we're within, intelligently define its next attack strategy as if a real adversary or red teamer would do. Uh, to Hussein's point, leveraging tools like Bloodhound is a spray and pray approach, which causes a ton of noise, uh, which any true threat actor or red teamer wouldn't do because they're trying to say as secret or as subtle as possible. After through a number of enumeration techniques, we'll then make a intelligent decision and in what our attack strategy will be through that PICUS intelligent decision engine. By enumeration, we'll then identify the best attack strategy to get to our attacker objective. In this case, we found some type of modifiable service escalation capability. Uh, we're exploiting a vulnerable Windows service uh, that has been misconfigured um, through you know, directory or file or configuration permissions would allow an attacker to escalate their own privileges. We then would then run the number of harvesting techniques we configured by identifying the best path or what the least path of resistance might be to accomplish our goal we'll identify any kind of credential access type of techniques uh, when it comes to credential dumping via LSAS. Um, in this case, we were able to find three hashes related to LSAS, uh, doing to sit all the way from SAM dumping, um, seeing if we were able to find potential admin accounts with the same password, all the way to LSA secret dumping, uh, to then leveraging any kind of potential successful credential accesses um, to move from one system to another. And eventually we found an asset where we can leverage uh, that credential dump of those hash credentials to move to another asset where we would compromise another host within the network. And again, we would then run the same number of harvesting techniques or attack techniques or credential accesses uh, to privilege escalations to eventually determine some type of attack path to accomplish our objective. And again, that is obtaining domain admin privileges. Once we are able to successfully achieve that attacker objectives, we'll then show you the quickest path to achieve that attacker objectives. Leaving off of compromising that one system via SMB exec and leveraging a hash through LSAS credential dumping, we're able to make a user change on the system, leverage and determine that a local administrative password solution is being leveraged, um, which then was able to enumerate some type of credentials, identifying a workstation that could be a target, implanting a session, again, through an SMB exec vulnerability or protocol, um, and then eventually achieving some type of domain admin privileges, uh, which we'll share with you, um, as we can see here, uh, that we were successful in running simulations. The best part yet is we're not just here to show you the problems. We want to give you the answers on how to mitigate these individual successful attack techniques uh, when it comes to achieving the overall attacker objectives. So here within the PICUS attack path validation, we want to give you the answers. We want to show you how we can go about mitigating this successful LSAS credential dumping technique. We we'll give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to remediate or mitigate these techniques in the future to hopefully break this capability when it comes to leveraging lateral movement and obtaining those domain admin privileges. And that applies to every single step within the attack path validation simulations uh, within the solution overall. Great. Thank you very much for the overview, Eric. That was, mm -hmm. that was really great. And I think just to, to echo what you said at the end there, it's about the ability to take action to eliminate those paths, isn't it? It's not just mm -hmm. about identifying them, a lot of security teams struggle um, with the results of pen testing, for instance, because it's not very actionable. They don't know what to do next to be able to really, uh, remediate or mitigate some of the vulnerabilities and misconfigurations in their network. So at PICUS, yeah, we really help you to not just identify, but also address those attack paths with, with those mitigation um, recommendations. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that we, we are at the top of the hour, um, and I want to just leave in a few more minutes for, for questions at the end. Uh, really appreciate everybody in our audience for, for, for staying with us to, to this point. 
Um, we have had a few um, questions posed um, via the, the Q and A, um, so I'll um, I'll read um, a few of those out uh, out now. Um, the first one uh, was uh, from from Cameron. Um, and does the Picus solution propose a prioritization of detectors attack paths? Um, so you covered this a little bit in the demo, Eric, but would you just want to kind of reiterate the, the point here around kind of identifying the shortest paths? Yeah, absolutely. I think at the end of the day, you have to think about it from an attacker's perspective, right? And then even when it comes to examples of um, automated tools like Bloodhound, right? We want to be as um, subtle as possible in the environment. But we also, if you think of it from an attacker's perspective, they're not going to try to attempt uh, compromising every single asset in the environment. They're trying to get to their objective or attacker goal um, as quickly as possible in the least path of resistance. Um, at the end of the day, we're all human, right? Even when it comes to hackers or APT groups or ransomware gangs that might be out there in today's threat landscape, they're not looking to create a bunch of noise nor are they looking to spend a lot of cycles or effort when it comes to breaching a potential um, infrastructure and compromising potential assets or, or harvesting credentials to obtaining domain admin privileges. If they can get there as quickly as possible, is the same way we should live in our mindset as we prioritize our ability to detect these potential attack paths and which of those are the quickest for any attacker attacker to achieve in an environment as if in a true attacker would and how we might respond to those as quickly as possible as well. Uh, so they are hand in hand uh, when it comes to both sides of the coin and the effort that falls between, you know, an offensive team or a red or a, a black hat individual to, you know, a white hat um, perspective to even a, a blue team or, or a defensive team perspective. I've um, got another one for you from uh, Tafik, um, who's asked, um, is it mandatory to run the APV simulation with a domain admin uh, user or domain admin privileges? Uh, actually, yeah, you do not need to uh, start with a domain admin user. Uh, you can uh, set the simulation for starting with an unprivileged user and discover uh, attack paths using that user or instruct the APV that you should uh, privilege escalation and then do the simulation and also start with an admin user. And all possibilities are on the table and you can use either three of them. Um, does um, APV only support Windows environments or will it run on uh, Linux as well? Is, is a question that we had from the chat. Eric, Eric, do you want to take that one? Um, as far as operating system support, um, Hussein, I, I know we can definitely do Windows devices for uh, the executable as well as the um, ability to run off memory. Uh, can you provide some insight if we can also support Linux devices as well as the initial access point when it comes to running the execution of the simulations? Actually, we are using a fileless approach. Uh, mm -hmm. We do not to, uh, insert and uh, uh, deploy an agent for uh, the initial access machine uh, in APV. And also, in a limited scope in SCB, we can do uh, that in moments uh, using Linux machines. But uh, generally, uh, the demand is coming from the Windows side. So often you know, people are asking for for us to do the Active Directory attacks and letter movement attacks in, in the Windows systems. So uh, compared to Windows, uh, we do Linux machines, but in, in Windows systems, we are much more capable. Thank you very much, Jens. Um, so I think we're just about out of time. Um, apologies if we didn't get round to answering your question, and um, we'd be happy to to respond to you after the session. Um, alternatively, if there's a question that you think of, um, feel free to to pose it. Get in touch with um, the Pickers team. Um, we'd only be happy to help um, tell you a bit more about attack path management and lateral movement and how uh, how our solution can help to support your needs uh, in this area. 
as we've heard throughout today's session, um, lateral movement, it is an increasingly hot topic in security. Um, and I think among some of the key takeaways from this session really are this need to adopt more of an assumed breach mindset, to not just focus on security at your perimeter, um, but really develop this mindset where you assume that a breach will occur at some point and really focus your effort also on, on limiting uh, any damage um, that an attacker could do once they have that initial access to your environment. And Hussein, um, during part of the sessions, shared some helpful tips um, to help you um, to uh, reduce uh, any, any any impact of an attack in your, in your network. Um, just a final reminder before we go, um, feel free to check out the media tab. There are some more helpful resources in there for you to, to take away. Um, Hussein referenced the red report and the findings around the most prevalent attack techniques used in the in the wild. And feel free to um, to take that report away with you and, and have a look at that. There's also a, a report on Active Directory security, which is something that we, we've also touched upon. Um, all that remains to be said then is really to thank um, Eric and Hussein for their for their insights today. Um, really great discussion, guys. I'm sure we could have gone on much longer. Um, but uh, always good to talk. And then, of course, um, thank you to, to, the, to the audience and, and everybody for, for, for stopping. Um, I realize that we're running slightly over. Um, so really, thank you for your attention today. Uh, and if you do have any questions, um, please, again, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and we'd also be happy to, to show you um, attack path validation or any other aspects of our platform. Uh, in a one-to-one -one demonstration. Um, so yeah, please do feel free to reach out if we can help you in any way. Great, thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Until next time, thanks Take a lot. Bye-bye.